This podcast provides a platform for our guests to share their experiences and inspire our listeners to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams. As you listen, we invite you to explore how these concepts apply to your own story. You know what to do. Be great and be grateful. We're mic'd up with Mike DeChocho. All right, we are here with Paul Pack. Paul, thanks for being here, brother. Always a pleasure, Mike. I appreciate you uh, asking me to do this, and I'm looking forward to it. Man, shout out to VSP Graphics. That's where we're hanging out. Yep. Kind of an intimate setting here in the studio, the studio lights. We like to Every- keep things dark. That adds to the suspense <laughs> of the graphic design projects that we like to overwhelm people with. <laughs> I mean, we're going to do a quick, I'm going to cut to it too and show a little tour of VSP behind us. It's a cool place. Um, we have Trace and, and the girls are doing some graphic design and they're throwing logos up on trucks as we speak right yep. behind There's their back. There's always here. a hubbub of activity going on around it's a, here. It's a, it's a fun place to it be. Is. I'm glad we got to do this podcast today. Um, and what I'm going to do is read your bio. So if okay. anybody doesn't rec- look at this face right here. Do you guys recognize this man? 24 years. Just from longevity. <laughs> it, you know, I've been around long enough to, uh, you know, to have seared my image into people's memory, I guess. But but that's the fun part of what I've been able to do here in Western New York is hopefully do a good enough job over that, that period of time and people want to keep me around. So. Right. And, or maybe you guys recognize his voice because he's also on uh, That on still radio freaks clip. me out a little bit. Sometimes, like, people will come up to me and particularly from having been on television as long as I was, people sometimes across a store or whatever, they're like, I heard your voice. You know, and it still freaks me out a little bit that people would recognize just the voice. But, yeah. you know, uh, it, I, I've probably done as much radio almost as I have television in this town, so it shouldn't be a surprise to me that maybe the voice is recognizable. Yeah, it's under, it's understandable. It is definitely a distinct voice. I mean, even maybe when you're ordering your coffee and you drive <laughs> yeah. to the, hey, Paul, how, how you doing, Paul? I haven't had again? that happen yet, but it could. <laughs> Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, buckle up, because Paul Peck is a sports broadcaster with 30 years experience in TV and radio, currently the voice of the UB Bulls in his 20th year now calling Bulls football and basketball games on TV and radio. He's part of the UB Athletics duties and also includes uh, hosting the coaches' TV and radio shows as well. Paul's connection to Western New York sports is also on display when he leads the broadcast of the Beat the Champ Bowling Show, the nation's longest-running local bowling show. And as the media world has changed, Paul also has changed with it. He and partner Kevin Sylvester launched Buffalo Sports Page in 2017. The sports website features videos, podcasts, analysis focused on Buffalo's local pro and college teams. And previously, Paul served, as we mentioned, as sports anchor, reporter, and producer at WIVB TV for 24 years. In that role, he covered all four Buffalo Super Bowls, mm-hmm. the Buffalo Sabres in the Stanley Cup Finals, NCAA Basketball Tournament, and the Daytona 500. And Paul also served as the radio sideline reporter for the Buffalo Bills Football Network. And it doesn't end there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a long play. list of stuff. But it's all great, man. Uh, you have you also were the master of ceremonies. Very cool opportunity uh, for the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Fun event, yep. And one of the largest sports banquets in Western New York. He's also involved in local business community as the vice president, as we just mentioned, of the sports development at, right here at VSP Graphic Group. And it's a company focused on enhancing athletic facilities at the professional, college, and the high school levels. There you go. Is that it? Is that enough? That, that's it right there. If anyone is still watching and listening know, right? after all of that. But, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, Mike, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about this, it's it, sports broadcasting has always been an industry where you where you had opportunities came to you, you wanted to be versatile, you wanted to be able to do a lot of different things. That's kind of how I came up in the business was, was you prided yourself on being able to go from one sport to another, radio to television, whatever it may be. And then as the world has changed around us, I've had to adapt to things outside of sports broadcasting, which is why my role here at VSP has been so much fun for me. Mm-hmm. What, what would you say as a youngster, um, you know, getting you involved or getting you interested 
in broadcasting? Did you have a, a sport that kind of led you into it? Well, or? you know, I think it, there was an early gravitation towards the sports world as a fan, as a kid who used to play with his buddies and shoot baskets in the in the driveway, you know, that kind of stuff. I always always loved being a part of sports, loved watching it, loved reading about it. Um, pretty early on realized that playing it was never really going to be in my future. <laughs> so, there, there, you know, I think every sportscaster always says there's a point in time where you say, I'm never going to play this, but how can I stay involved in it and sure. I think one of those ways becomes being able to broadcast or write about it or talk about it so um, that was that that very you know by the time I hit sort of high school I knew I wanted to do that I, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in sports casting and that you know that came from from growing up in a, in, a, in a time when some of the greats who have ever um, sat in front of a microphone that would look yeah. very similar to this one uh, you know in the 70s uh, you know those were your influences those were the people you said boy I would love to be able to do what they do uh, sure. and that and I, so my focus was very specific as I moved through high school I actually started to do some radio and some television in high school uh, and then knew that college I wanted to go and pursue that was that local in western New York uh, no I grew up in the, in New Jersey uh, on the okay. Jersey Shore is where I grew up and um who were some of the guys that you were listening to on the radio? Well, I mean, the, you know, it's it you know, it was the national guys. It was the Dick Enbergs of the world. It was the Keith Jacksons. It was the Kurt Gowdys. Um, you know, locally in New York, Len Berman and Warner Wolf were were you know Bob Costas. Those were you know those were guys that were based in New York. Marv Albert. You know, those and they're they're all national guys too. Uh, you know, and it was listening to Mets broadcasts uh, with Bob Murphy and and listening to the Giants and the Jets and the Nets with John Sterling at the time before he became the Yankees announcer mm -hmm. you know it, there were so many pro sports teams in the New York area that you, you there was never a day when there wasn't something going on and that just kind of fueled my passion for it uh, and then that kind of led me in the decision and you know as I go from New Jersey to where I am now the pit stop in between was going to Syracuse University okay. kind of getting a feel for upstate New York uh, having wonderful experiences there uh, and then having a job open up in Buffalo and I'm like well I, I know a little bit about Buffalo from having sure. been in Syracuse and uh, I knew it was a great sports town, and, and you know, at the time I'm 22 years old, and you don't figure you're going to spend the next 30 years there, but that's mm -hmm. how it's turned out. Not to age you, uh, so what year was that? Uh, I went to college in 1983. I was a freshman. Okay. Graduated high school in 83, went to college in 83, graduated college in 1987, took the job here in the summer of 1988. So you picked the perfect time, yeah. 1988, to My get time involved was good. in Buffalo sports. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I get here on the brink of what really starts that Bill Super Bowl run that, you know, yeah. they were really good in 88, and then 89 took a little step back, but that kind of propelled them into 90, 91, 92, 93 on the Super Bowl trips. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and that, you know, I, it's funny. I used to joke with Van Miller. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to say, you know, boy, you didn't have to live through the 80s because the Bills were bad in the 80s yeah. around. You'd have to live through that because um, I get here in 88 and it starts this run of almost 10 years of them being really, really good. Who would have known that I would ultimately pay for that for a little <laughs> while through most of the 2000s? Yeah, yeah. well, you, you came in at such a fun time. I was growing up during that, you know, I was a little guy at the time and I remember thinking to myself I just thought the Super Bowl meant who's going to play Buffalo I mean because <laughs> think great. about how that how that feels four years in a row having the biggest party of the year wasn't Christmas wasn't Thanksgiving it was a Super Bowl party my brother and I remember I'll credit my brother he put together with like tin foil he built a little Lombardi trophy awesome we had a big cake and the whole thing and I remember uh, my uncle at the time had one of the big, you know, the flat screen TVs back then were like this yeah, wide. Yeah, they were, yeah. They're they about were. a thousand pounds, right. you know? And that's why I never see them when they're on the side of the road. Nobody takes them nope. anymore because they're huge. Yep. And he was the first one in the family to have that. And I just remember how fun they were, but just how sick you felt afterwards, too. Yep. It was so polarizing it, in it, the moment. It was such an amazing run um, that we'll never, I don't think, ever see in, yeah. at any level of NFL where a team can sustain success for that long. But yeah, there is a, there's a bit of a hole in everybody's heart that, that they went and did something that will never be done before, but they didn't win. And, yeah. and I get it. I feel, for, I feel for people here that, you know, that, that we have to sort of be proud for being a runner-up. And, and there's something about that that's just not fair. I don't think it diminishes the greatness of those Bills teams from then. Sure. Um, you know, and clearly you're seeing that in how many of them are in the Hall of Fame. But yeah, to have won one would have been nice. There's a lot of parity now, and so it's hard to have kind of that team that is... This was the pre-free agency days. Right. This yeah. was the pre-salary cap days. You could have... 
seven, eight superstars on a team Bill than Bill which Payton. the Bills did, yeah. you can't have that anymore. You just It just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, you know, even the way the Patriots have done what they've done, they haven't done it with superstar players uh, yeah. or quantities of them. They've cycled their way through it. So, yeah, I don't, we'll, we'll never see the collection of talent mm-hmm. that you had on those Bills teams ever again. And, 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 again, that's something that I think fans in this town can kind of hold up to. Absolutely. So... You know, tell us about being a broadcaster in the early days before social media and the, what I call the instant update media, right? Yeah, I mean, you look at a you look at a career like mine and anyone that was in this career in the '90s and the pre-internet days, and there's there's literally that dividing line of how the industry and business has changed. I like to tell people that when I started at Channel Four in 1988, there was a uh, a noon, a six, and an eleven o'clock newscast. Uh, and the noon didn't have a sports cast in it per se. So if I was assigned to go cover a Sabres practice at 10 in the morning, I literally did not have to have anything ready to be on the air till six <laughs> o'clock. And think about how bizarre that is in the world that we live in today. Yeah. Uh, you know, and as the years went by, there were five and 5.30 newscasts and 10 o'clock newscasts. But but really in the early 2000s, when, when the internet became what it is, um, the, 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 the need for someone to come home from work having not heard what had gone on that day and turn the TV on and sit in front of that TV at six o'clock to find out what had gone on that day, that doesn't exist anymore. And that changed the, that changed the media business across the board uh, mm-hmm. in almost everything. And, and, and in a lot of ways for the better, because it's immediate and now I can pick up my phone and I can find out whatever I want to know. Yeah. But in some ways for the worse, because now there's no perspective. There's yeah. no ability for someone like me to go through five or six interviews from a morning skate and pick out the best parts of it and find the perspective or find the overriding picture of it and tell that story to people. Because now it's like, get it on the air. What The first thing that was said is on the air. What's this? What's that? Um, I missed that a little bit. I think a lot of us that have been in the business long enough miss the fact that we had a chance to be more of storytellers. I don't know that media people anymore are storytellers. They're just immediate sort of purveyors of information. Yeah, you def- that's, you read my mind. That's where I kind of was going with this is, you know, it's instant fact. It's not only the score, but it's something that happened. You had that crazy situation uh, with Mason Rudolph on that, I think it was a Thursday or Monday night. Yeah, game. yeah, sure, the fight, yeah, there. you know. And, like, you know, the whole world's talking about it because it just happened. There's not really, like, a breaking report from a sports personality, like, you could have came to the table with that story and broke the news to Buffalo that night or anyone who didn't see yeah, it. Yeah, well, sure. It would have been a big story. You know, I mean, I, 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 the first thing I would have said would be that this, I, that stuff used to happen all the time in the 90s at training camp. There used to be fights at training camp where guys would grab and swing helmets. So so yeah. it's not the first time I've ever seen it happen. Sure. doesn't make it right. First yeah. time I've ever seen it happen in a game. But, you know, again, I, I, I think something that I try to build my career on is a little bit of perspective based on history, mm-hmm. based on having done this for a long time, uh, we live in an immediate world where everything that happened last night is the greatest thing we've ever seen. And that's, it's not true. Yeah. It's just not true. Um, right. And sometimes I feel like it's part of my job to give people an idea that, hey, these things have happened before. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's when it was then. And here's why it, what it led to now. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's not really part of the world that we live in anymore. Mm-hmm. In, yeah. in sports, in politics, and anything. Right. So walk us through that. Your live sideline reporting with the Bills to then uh, doing the post-game reviews Mm -hmm. or interviews and then also going live in the evening on Channel 4. Well, so, so, you know, so Van Miller was obviously, you know, a big mentor of mine from my years of having worked with him at Channel 4 and he was the voice of the Bills for all those years. So at... In the, in the mid-90s, the Bills changed radio stations, and they didn't. that station group didn't really have a staff of sports people, so they were kind of looking for people to man some of those spots. So Van recommended me, and, and I was already traveling with Channel 4 to all of the games home and road, so I was already there. So it was a rather convenient uh, opportunity for me to say, hey, I just get to the game a little earlier because I'm host of the pregame show, and then I'm going down to the sidelines. And I'm host of the post game show, and you know, for any of us that have been in the business for a long time, television is is great. Um, it, it there's more money in television. There's a little more prominence in television, but radio is the ultimate creative outlet um, where you there's no pictures to rely on. It mm-hmm. is you and the descriptive ways that you're talking about something that inform people what it is you're seeing to tell them what they should be 
picturing in their mind. Mm -hmm. So I've always loved, which is why I do a lot of radio still to this day, I've always loved the, the challenge of radio. So um, so I started doing pregame and the halftime and the postgame, and then the Bills towards the late 90s said, we're going we're gonna to try a sideline reporter because that had been become much more prominent around the country. Mm -hmm. So I wind up getting the assignment of being the first ever Bills Radio Network sideline reporter. I did that for cool. five or six or maybe almost eight or almost ten years maybe. Uh, and that was fun, dealing with the weather, uh, dealing with trying to watch a lot of things at once, uh, what's going on in the field, what's going on on the sidelines with a guy that's injured. Uh, you, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, the, the, the it's great to be on the sidelines of the NFL game, the speed and the strength and the power is unbelievable to witness, but in a lot of times it's the worst seat in the house. You sure. just, you can't see a lot. Yeah. And thank God for the Jumbotrons. Um, you know, you relied on them to kind of see the replays of the plays that maybe you didn't get that good a look at. Mm -hmm. But it but it added to the challenge of of being able to describe when John Murphy or Van would toss it down to me. Hey, what'd you see on that play? Um, I needed to have an answer. Whether <laughs> I saw it because it was right in front of me or whether yeah. it was on the opposite side of the field and I was looking up at the Jumbotron sort of repeating yeah. a, a little bit of what I'm seeing at the moment. So yeah. it was a lot of fun. And again, that's just the challenge that comes with being on radio. That's that's phenomenal. Now, did, did your family embrace broadcasting did you enjoy analyzing games at a young age were you kind of like doing this in your head with yeah i think you know again when you're a young kid sitting watching sports on tv um you know again back in a day when there when every game wasn't always on and then there was a national game of the week and that was mm -hmm. a big deal you know and bills fans are excited about getting national television here two of the next you know two of their three games that that they're playing um Got you know the sunday that, flex yeah, well, the Sunday Flex, the Thanksgiving. But, I mean, back then, uh, you know, you didn't get Red Zone Channel. You didn't have streaming. You, you know, you saw the game that was on. Mm -hmm. And if the Bills didn't make that game and you weren't in Buffalo, you might get them on a Monday Night Football or whatever. That was a big deal. So, you know, that's how you experience the halftime highlights from Howard Cosell where how a lot of us – learned about the rest of the league and then yeah. ESPN comes in in the early Chris 80s Berman. and you start Chris Berman and you start to pick things up that way. So yeah. so it all kind of led to molding perspectives and understanding and why I'm a big I'm a big proponent of the question why. Why did it happen? Why didn't it happen? Why did they win? Why didn't they win? Why is that guy playing well? Why is that guy not playing well? Um, that's that's what I take to, into a lot of the broadcasting that I do is trying to answer the question why. Mm -hmm. What would you say your favorite part of the broadcasting world is? I know it's a grind. There's a lot of games. I mean, Being at the games is the best part. Being able to walk into a stadium, and sometimes it's even more fun when you're on the road because you know you're in the minority and you know that you're, you're the enemy there. To be able to walk into a stadium uh, on a Sunday morning and with the anticipation level of a big game or a Saturday for me now, um, you know, feeling like I think I know what's going to happen. But and, that, and ultimately, the best part about sports is, and thus sports broadcasting is we can all think we're smart and we can all think we know what's going to happen, but until it gets kicked off, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. And there might be something that happens that day that you would have never anticipated or guessed, but in my job, I've got to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of fun. I mean, as a fan, that's what you want. You don't want, you know, when you have like the, the Thanksgiving game, when I think one person out of 15 I saw actually picked the bills. Sure. And they all had us dead in the water, you right. know. And uh, then we, you know, you, you know how the the game unfolds. Of course, unfolds. So of course. 25, 15, 26, 15. Yep, yep. I mean, it was um, a it was a huge win, one of the biggest wins in years for yeah. this franchise. I have to say, it felt like the most complete performance by right. a Bills team. Yeah. Also, on, in the national spotlight for sure. It, I think that had a lot to do with it because the Bills just don't get the national attention um, as much to do with their long run of a lack of success and as much to do with our market size. Um, we don't, you know, we don't dictate that kind of coverage. And it has yeah. to come when the team is good. That's really the only way you're going to get it. Um, it's just the reality of it. I mean, you know, we're not New York. We're not Philly. We're not Chicago. I mean, you're, you know, the networks are going to lean towards those teams and those games because they generate bigger ratings than a place like Buffalo. But ultimately, what the way to shut all that up is to go out and win and to prove that you belong there. And that's why you're seeing their game against the Steelers being flexed. Right. I'll say this, not to challenge you, but to challenge that mindset and mentality that because Buffalo's a small market, the ratings aren't going to be there. Because that Thanksgiving game was actually the most watched regular season football game in three years right. out of any game. Well, and, and again, not... not... <laughs> 
it's a great statistic. It has sure. more to do with being on Thanksgiving at 430 with the Cowboys playing. I mean, l- let's be honest. I know there are people that wanted to see what the Bills are all about, uh-huh. but probably not as many as were watching for those other reasons. And ultimately, for fans that don't understand it, it is all about how many people are in your market. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, you know, a highly rated Bills game is still going to draw less people watching than a medium rated Chicago or New York game. Yeah. That's the reality of it. And I know enough people who work at the national level of broadcasting mm-hmm. where they say um, they're going to pick an Eagles Giants game, even if both teams stink. Because the ratings, numbers, because of the size of the markets and the national followings that those teams have are always going to be bigger and better than any Bills game. Mm-hmm. What I also heard, too, is the, it was the most watched Thanksgiving game in 25 years, too. And uh, I know the Bills haven't been on in 27, so again, it's probably Yeah, I, I mean, again, that, not to burst that, everybody's yeah. bubble that has more to do with the Cowboys being on sure. and, and, and and an interesting matchup. And I'm not to discount the Bills. There was some curiosity factor that maybe made people want to watch. Mm-hmm. But a lot of those things have more to do with market sizes and things like that than they necessarily did with the Bills. Mm-hmm. How have you, I mean, you've witnessed the the industry change quite a bit. You already alluded to it a little bit. Um, Speak candidly about it. I mean, people listening right now, I think, can benefit from your expertise in broadcasting, kind of the way it came, you you got into it in the late 80s, where it's at now, and then how did you transition into what you're doing now? Well, I think in the late 2000s, clearly the industry had changed, um, you know, away from what it was, and then kind of what you were seeing happen, particularly locally here, was a bit of a shift away from a model where the local TV stations encouraged their people like me to want to stay. Uh, and made it worth our while to stay. Um, they liked continuity. Buffalonians liked seeing the same faces tell them what they need to know. Mm-hmm. So for many, many years, that was the model, that the, the Channel 4 and 2 and 7 did not want to lose prominent local people. Then I think that started to shift because that meant those people made more money and, mm-hmm. and needed to be paid more. And I think the business shifted away from desiring that to more meaner and leaner and younger and not so worried about someone who'd been on the air for 20 years and more worried about can we get someone cheaper that can do the camera work and do the reporting at the same time that saves us a salary um, is more tuned into the social media because maybe they had grown up with it more um, and and honestly just in general the I think that's why when you watch the local stations now there are a lot of unfamiliar faces and I hear that from people a lot and that's just the business model nationally is hiring younger kids with more of a skill set kind of working them to death for yeah. three years and then choosing to go get another group yeah. of younger kids. You see much more turnover. And that didn't appeal to me, Mike. It really right. didn't. It, it wasn't It wasn't what I did. It wasn't what I established my career on. I wasn't really interested selfishly in hauling a camera around after mm-hmm. earning what I had earned over 25 years. Sure. I wasn't good at it. I had, That's what the camera guys that I worked with were good at. And that's yeah. why the relationship that I had with all the camera guys that I worked with at Channel 4 was amazing because they're incredibly talented. What's your story today? Well, I want to do this. Okay, I'll get you those shots. Or, if you, or hey, I got an idea. Can we do this? Yeah, sure. That That's what made the stories sing. And when people in management didn't want the stories to sing anymore, they just wanted them out there, then that changed all the model. And I wasn't comfortable sure. with it. So I chose to kind of step away from it, um, to step away from being in that role at local television and at about 2012. Okay. Well, we're going to get to what you're doing now, which is very exciting. I've seen some of the work in the arenas that sure, some locally, some national level, including the Buffalo Bills. But uh, before we get to VSP, uh, if someone in the audience right here is listening or interested in becoming a broadcaster or doing color commentary today, what advice would you give them? Well, I, you know, I, I think, and again, it, it comes across as funny for me because all the things that I knew how to get into this business are kind of irrelevant now. But 
All that said, you still better be prepared. You mm-hmm. still better be informed. You better understand the material. You better understand what it is that you've been assigned to do. Uh, and frankly, it's never been easier in the world we live in to go Google something and find out yeah. about it. And I see it far too often where um, particularly some young people just are uninformed or or lack perspective or don't understand what happened in the 90s for the Bills that has a, a role in what is happening now. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those things don't change. A lot of the mechanics of doing the job change, um, but being prepared, being knowledgeable, um, being going into it with the intention of getting the best out of your interview subject and not making it all about you, I don't think that's changed at all. I, I think that's still the, the, the path to being a good reporter. And the number one talent, would you say, or one of the highest talents of a color commentator it's obviously the storytelling think sure. of, i think of rick Jenneret. you know I mean, yeah the way that it's you don't have to be watching the game you can picture it happening well and, and, and on that's top of every play and that's what i enjoy so much about the the radio work that i still do primarily calling the football games at ub is there's an incredible responsibility and challenge that that is handed to you to basically say fill the next three hours there is no script we're not going to tell you what's going to happen. You need to react to whatever is happening on the field, and you need to do it in a way that someone driving down the throughway with a basic knowledge of football can picture in their mind what it is that you're telling them. Is it a run to the left? Is it a run to the right? Is it a sprint? Is it a ball that's fired? Is it a ball that's lobbed? Uh, it, was, it a, was it a fierce tackle? Was it an ankle tackle? Uh, was it a grab of the jersey? Those are all things that help that person picture what is going on is it on the is it on the the numbers on the left is it down the hash marks on the right is it on the middle of the field is it a deep throw to the far sideline is it a dump pass to the near sideline um those are all the things that that i try to do when i'm describing a football game on the radio because i understand that's my responsibility to that person who can't see it for whatever reason um, but it's my job to help them understand it. And in the world that we live in now, the greatest test of that is, and they do this a lot at UB, they'll take my radio calls and then match them up to the highlights and run them throughout the week. And ultimately, sometimes you're kind of watching it going like this, like, did I get it right or not? Um, you know, did, did it, you know once... Well, you know, the, 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 the radio call happens in real time um, without the benefit of a replay. When you go and see it put to a replay, you're kind of like, okay, did I, did I, was I accurate? Was I correct in describing what it was I saw? Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's the ultimate test. I, I always go back to something Van Miller, who had an incredibly long career in radio, always told me was that in a lot of ways radio play-by-play separates the men from the boys in sports broadcasting. It's it's a lot easier to call a game on TV. The pictures mm-hmm. are 70% of the of the job. In foot in radio, the the description by me or by the broadcaster is 100 percent of the job say 90 percent of the job because the crowd noise mm-hmm. that you bring into the broadcast can have an effect in that yeah. too um but primarily what voice inflection is so important voice too. inflection that's something i learned from van i sometimes i tend to get a little wound up and maybe even yell a little bit too much sometimes i'm mad at myself or geez calm down already but but to me voice inflection is important uh, because i'm telling the person at home whether they should get excited about mm-hmm. something or not and it's if, a you're, Hail Mary, if you're how close is it of course if you're sneaking towards the edge of your seat, um, I want my voice to reflect that. If you should be disappointed as a Bulls fan, I want my voice to reflect that. Uh, if it's the what has the potential to be the most important play in the game, I have to understand that, and my voice should reflect that as well, and my description should reflect that. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that insight. Um, now, tell us a little bit about your friendship with Kevin Sylvester. And then uh, when did you guys meet and, and when did the partnership begin? Well, Kevin and I have known each other from back in the 90s because he's been in this town in various roles, a little more on the radio side and then his transition to the Sabres broadcasts from, from the 90s on. So we, we traveled in a lot of the same circles. We always respected each other. Uh, we became friends. And then I think after I decided to leave Channel 4, kind of bumped into each other. And we kind of looked at each other and said, geez, we've got a lot to offer because Kevin had been let go by the Sabres at that point. Um, and we were both sort of trying to find our way. 
and I think we both said to each other, we have a lot to offer mm -hmm. sports fans in this town, maybe don't have the outlets that we used to have. Well, what can we do about that? Maybe we can create our own outlets, and that ultimately led down to the road of buffalosportspage.com. And part of that was was a, a good group of people in this town who were similar to us that had moved away from local radio or television and were sort of searching for a way to get back into it um, and still had quality to offer. And that's why we had this incredible and still do incredible lineup of people that work with us at Buffalo Sports Page that really helped to give people some perspective through our experiences and through our, uh, you know, through what we've done through our entire careers. It's been two years now that you... Yeah, that we're get, we're, we're, yeah about two and a half years that it's been up and going. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. It, it, there's a lot of places that you can go get your Bills and Sabres news out sure. there. And, and it's a little hard sometimes cutting through the clutter of mm -hmm. all of that. Um, combined with the fact that the fans of today um, don't aren't, aren't necessarily defaulting to... Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 7, the Buffalo News, um, places that have long established. You know, um, there's a lot of great sites for Bills fans that are run by Bills fans mm -hmm. um, that do a wonderful job in their perspective. And in that, if that's what you want, you can go there to get it. If you want a different, more educated, and I only say educated because all of us went to school to be educated sure. by for this, yeah. educated and maybe perspective-based impression on what's going on sure. then that's what we've tried to create expertise call yeah it expertise is, yeah. i mean we yeah. all have expertise yeah. in our own world in our sure. own lives yeah. um the funny thing about sports is everybody th thinks they're yeah. an expert in yeah. sports yeah well but i mean doing it for 25 years on tv and 30 years now on radio I'd say that qualifies you. Next. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> thank you. I would like to think that I bring that experience to it, but like I said, not everybody is looking for that expertise. I yeah. think that's why you're seeing a lot of mainstream media right. struggling because not everybody needs to go to the Buffalo News to find out what they thought of the Bills game. There's a thousand other places, and mm. um, you know, again, it's no different than what we see in the news in the political world. If you lean one way, you're going to go to that part that tends to feed your leanings. Yeah. Um, like and putting a piece so of cheese and having it's those. no different than sports. If you are a Josh Allen lover, you're going to go to people that are going to tell you how great Josh Allen is. If you're a Josh Allen hater, you're going to go that way. I don't always know that there's a lot of people that want to know what the real in the middle opinion objective. always is. Yeah, objective, objective, yes. Objective view on it. Um, so what would you say the master plan for Buffalo Sports Page is? Do you have kind of a big picture? Well, you know, again, I mean, I think we, we've, we, we've created and tried to find a little niche for ourselves, and uh, we're trying to keep growing it, you know? I mean, again, there's a lot of competition. Um, there's competition with local established outlets. There's a competition with national outlets, things like The Athletic. Um, there's competition with uh, every, you know, with uh, every Bill's Mafia person that starts their own YouTube channel and, yeah. and podcast and and, and, and again, so, you know, our goal is to find a nice little niche. It doesn't have to be the biggest number of people, but we're hoping to get a nice, good core group of fans that like what we're doing. And I think we've established to some degree that already. Mm -hmm. And how can they check it out? Is it Buffalo Sports Yeah, buffalosportspage.com is the website. And at Buff Sports Page on, on Twitter and social media is the way that we link a lot of our stories back. So, uh, you know, and we've got great People like Bud Bailey and Bob Gone and, and you know who have covered sports throughout their entire careers have seen it and done it all, and that's kind of what we like having them around. You just reminded me of something. I was doing my homework. I was checking the website out, and a name popped up on there that I haven't thought about or seen in a long time. Jim Kubiak? Yeah, Jim. Uh, Jim and I did uh, was my color analyst on UB Broadcasts, football broadcast for many <laughs> years. And Jim's awesome, and he has a great track record and history in this town. Um, and now what Jim is doing now is working with young quarterbacks um, mm -hmm. from middle school to high school and teaching them the nuances of being a good quarterback. And well, he, was, he, he has, was the quarterback for the Buffalo Destroyers. That's those, right. And, you that know, uh, St. Francis... Yeah. Uh, Naval Academy, uh, bounced around the NFL. He was in training camps with the Colts and Peyton Manning and, and with a number of other places. And then the Arena League uh, and NFL Europe. He has seen it and done it all. And, you know, now he has this incredible, as, as his Western New York Quarterback Academy has grown, um, you know, uh, Joe Licata, the former UB great, 
who's now the coach of time and is one of his past students. Um, Jake Dolagala from St. Francis, who's a backup quarterback with the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, is is one of his students. And that's what Jim is great about. And again, the world has changed now where a lot of young athletes want that additional coaching outside of their high school teams, mm-hmm. specific to their position, specific to the fundamentals of the position. And that's what Jim is amazing at. So I have a really cool Jim Kubiak story that I'd like to share real quick. So my myself, my brother, and, and a handful of our friends had season tickets to the Buffalo Destroyers. Mm-hmm. We were, I was very sad the moment that uh, they decided to take the team away. I, I mean, I was kind of surprised that Buffalo didn't embrace it more because how much we do love our we're, sports we're team. Too, we're, we're too locked in on the Bills, we I are. think. And I think, you, not to interrupt you, but you're yeah. seeing that same challenge mm-hmm. with the new football leagues that have started, that, that Americans love NFL football. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily love all football. Um, and when some of these other leagues and the destroyers are don't have the star power, and yeah. I think sometimes people choose to do other things. And let's be honest, the NFL is a 20 not a 20, a 12-month, a year uh-huh. sport now. And in January, February, and April, people right. are locked in on the draft, draft more than they are on a, an Arena League team or sure. an XFL team. It's It was tough. I mean, it was a lot of fun, though, the 50 It was, field, absolutely. The, the kicks, there were nets, so the ball, if, if you miss the field goal, is a live ball, I believe. Um, it, it was crazy, but Jim It's Kubiak. gone, by the way, now. It's completely defunct arena football. Really? There aren't, yeah, they, they've hung on with a, a few cities over the years, but I think it's all completely gone now. I and I think a lot of that has to do with the NFL just dominating the, the, the sports world. Bad. The XFL starts in, Jan, in February, but the NFL just dominates year-round, and I think that's what people are spending yeah. their time. I'll be anxious to see what the XFL does. Um, the other league that played last year, the Alliance, just did not have the financial backing. Um, yeah. the, the XFL does, but the XFL doesn't have the stars. And it's a lot of retreads. And it's Cardell Jones, who couldn't make it as a quarterback here, who's going to be a starting quarterback. It's uh, There's a bunch of UB guys that are going to play in that league, which is great for them. Um, but I'll be curious to see whether Americans embrace it or not. Yeah. It's good because it, it gives an opportunity for the player who maybe lost their way, almost like, well, the, yeah, we have the CFL um, with Duke Williams. You know, he goes there, he's mm-hmm. a leading receiver last year, gets an opportunity with Buffalo because he got to have some film. Yeah, those are film. few and far between, though, Mike. Yeah. There's very few players that, once they go to another league like that, ever mm-hmm. really get the chance to come back. In most cases, guys who are in the CFL and guys who are playing in the XFL are guys that have tried for the NFL for three or four years, been mm-hmm. in training camps, been on rosters, and just kind of got pushed out. Sure. And the likelihood of a lot of them coming back is pretty slim. It's slim, but those guys still get to play, right? Sure, They're absolutely. Right. I've said that to some of the guys I know at UB. You're still getting paid to play football. Run with yeah, it. Yeah, go with it. So my Jim Kubiak story real quick. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Eight, 18 years. I just did the math in my head. Did you see smoke coming out of my ears? <laughs> 18 years ago, so I was, I was 15 years old. Uh, freshman, sophomore high school, going to all the games. We had Willie Lada. We had Bobby Olive. Bobby Jim, Olive. Jim Kubiak. Yep. Those are Mace, uh, Kevin Mason was kind Kevin of a backup Mason, quarterback. Yeah. He also played some receiver. Yep. Yep. I think he was a West Seneca guy. He was. He West was Seneca a former East Western Seneca? New York Player of the Year. West Seneca yeah. West, I believe. Okay, I want to I get my East and West. I can't. Could I, be. I feel East. like I it get was confused. East. I don't know if anyone knows. Uh, email me or text me. But so the the story is, we're, I'm going out 15 years old, going with my family um, to Arizona. My grandfather had passed away, so this was 2001. Okay, um, we hop on the plane and I'm looking around and I'm like, what plane did we just get on? Is this a mistake? Check our tickets. We're on the plane with the Buffalo Destroyers. The entire <laughs> team, every player, coach, it was literally my family and the Buffalo Destroyers right. on this entire plane. I sit next to... Jim Kubiak. Jim Kubiak, quarterback. I recognize him. He's probably thinking, oh man, I got four and a half hours with this 15-year-old kid. But he was cool. He was He's checking his playbook. one of the playbook. best human beings I have ever had the chance to be around. I, I love football, so I'm looking at He's got the plays, and he was talking to me, and he just, you know, he didn't give me the cold shoulder. Nope. But not, I was not Jim's I, style. Even that 15, I mean, I was very mindful of, don't bug this guy, but let him know you appreciate the team. You, you, and actually, we went out there, and of course, we had to take care of business with my grandpa, but we went to the Arizona Rattlers oh, game. Oh, nice. 
And I have to say, they really put on a show. Mm -hmm. Um, The announcer, I mean, they had like live entertainment in between plays. It was pretty crazy. Right. And the place was packed. And the fans were just crazy into it, which I was surprised. Um, And I just remember coming back thinking, we need to get that kind of environment in Buffalo. Uh, it's almost like a bandits game, how it's just alive. Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So that was my, my that's great my Kubiak story. I would love to reconnect with him. Maybe Nothing surprises be- me. Jim is an Jim is an <laughs> awesome guy. I had a lot of fun uh, calling games with him for almost five years, I believe it was. He would be a cool guest on the podcast. Yes, he no, would. No pressure. Let's see if we can make it happen. What is your coolest story or moment over the years? Well, you know, this always surprise. I tell this story a lot, and it always surprises people when they ask me, like, what's the coolest sports moment or event or sure. single singular moment that you've ever been at? And most people would think I would say Super Bowl mm-hmm. or they, or the Stanley Cup Finals. And I always say the the one singular most amazing moment I've ever experienced in sports is when I had the opportunity in the mid '90s to go cover the Daytona 500. Um, and wow. to be on the infield on pit road at the start of the Daytona 500, 250,000 people on their feet screaming, 43 cars coming around, the noise, the atmosphere, just that singular moment for the green flag to drop just sent chills throughout me. And one of the, the, the coolest single moment just ahead of like the kickoff of a Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, that's what that's one of the best moments I've ever been a part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, obviously all the great Bills games and things like that. The you know some of the great Sabers wins, the Chris Drury goal in the late '90s to tie the game up with the Rangers, the overtime wins. Um, you know, I was there in the in the odd for the Dave Hannon goal in the four overtime game. Uh, you know, I've been a part of a seven overtime UB game. I've been a part of UB winning bowls, winning MAC championships. Those are all on there. But but that day twenty five hundred moment was something I'll never forget. Yeah, that's that's really. I'm I'm not really into it, so I don't know too much about it. But I have to just imagine that. Thing. It's just every emotion, every people. visceral sense comes <laughs> at you. The smell of the cars, the gas, the sound, the the vibration. It, it, it's it, That's why people who are big racing fans love going to races. Were, were you a little bit scared about like the guys flying off the course? No, or? no. Where where you are, you're on you're in the infield and okay. and you know and, yeah. and obviously even when there's accidents, the there's you know that no, never worry yeah. about that at all. Cool. So this kind of ties into it. Um, you know, we talk, talked about a lot of those big moments in Buffalo sports history. So what would you say makes the city of Buffalo a special place? Um, you know, it's definitely well, I, different. It's here. it's the pe- it's the passion that people have for their city and for their sports here. We are one of the smallest. Um, markets with more than one professional sports team. So um, the, the 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 Bills and the Sabers are in a lot of ways our connection to the big time, mm-hmm. right? You know we're you know we're 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 not Des Moines, Iowa. You know sure. they don't have a bill an NFL team. Um, so that that there's a pride factor in in that. Right. Um, but it's just the nature of Buffalonians as a whole. They're passionate about it. You know, again, I told you I grew up in New York where there's nine or ten professional teams and millions and millions of people. So you have some Jets fans and some Giants fans and some Rangers fans and some Islanders fans and and and. They they are passionate about their team, but there's not one singular um, focus, and that's what it always was here. There's a singular mm-hmm. focus to the Bills and the Sabers, and I learned it very quickly when I came to this town. I learned as a sportscaster, you better understand that, and those people are as crazy knowledgeable as you are, and you better you better be held to that standard, and you better uphold that standard, and try to go beyond that standard. And just just in general, what we are as Buffalonians and and, and how we treat people and how we act in our lives and, and we're not fancy and we're not shiny. Um, we are what we are. I think that's what makes this such a great sports yeah. town and that's what's been the most fun thing for me to be a part of covering sports for over 30 years here. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And So tell us more about your journey after broadcasting. You got into financial planning for a while yep. and now you're at VSP. Got into financial planning. It was a wonderful experience working with the guys at AXA Advisors. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about owning my own business which essentially it was, and I learned a lot about about having more of a direct impact on helping people. Um, it's neat to look into a TV camera and know you're speaking to however many thousands of people, but to sit across from someone's kitchen table and help them solve a problem right. um, or make sure their retirement was 
properly situated. It was a really great experience for me. I enjoyed it. But the passion to be involved in sports just was pulling at me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was still living in the sports world, doing stuff at UB and doing some freelancing. And I kind of decided that I couldn't do both. I couldn't do justice to being a good financial planner if I was still living in the sports world um, and vice versa. And I just had just too much passion um, and in, in what's kind of in my blood. So it was a very hard decision to step away from things at AXA, partly because I didn't really know what my future was going to be. Um, I knew it was going to have to be me creating more of a freelance model, of which maybe people don't know that a lot. Um, it, aside from working at a local TV station, most of the sports people that you see who call games in particular are freelancers. Mm -hmm. They work based on the amount of assignments. Hey, we're gonna, we want you to do 10 football games, we're gonna pay you X per football game. Um, and that's how a lot of that world works, from, from tech guys to camera guys to announcers. So I was willing to embrace that a little bit and figure out how um, I could stay as busy as I wanted to stay by being involved in what I wanted to do. And that allowed me to do some more things at UB. And, mm -hmm. and the folks at UB have been incredible and wonderful to me. Um, and I've gotten some great opportunities to be really involved in doing a lot of stuff there, stuff that I love doing. Even more so now, I'm actually working there part-time, a couple days a week, helping them with content, social media, interviews and stuff and and that's been a lot of fun for me as well too but then there's the bowling show that's once a month uh you know there's occasional freelance opportunities to do games here and there um but it was a matter of me getting back to what i wanted to really do and it was a matter of my family being supportive of that um it's been a challenge there's no question about it you know i don't necessarily have one job um there's no nine to five necessarily for me which is both fun and a challenge because uh, it's fun that you don't always have to be somewhere at nine in the morning, but when you get up at nine and you go, hmm, I don't have anything to do today, then you realize you're not making any money that day. Um, and that's not different for me than it is for a lot of people that sure. have chosen to go that route. And someone once told me that there's a name for it now. It's called the gig economy, right? Yeah. Playing off of yeah. musicians who play gigs. Um, I work on True. gigs. I, you know, what's my gig today? Well, I'm calling a basketball game. What's my gig today? I'm working at VSP. Um, yeah. You know, I got to close a deal here. I got to work something. I got a bowling show. So um, it, it's taken a little while to get enough traction to be able, be able to feel comfortable with it, to earn the kind of money that you feel like you want to make. Um, right. But it gives me the freedom to do a lot of cool stuff and do what I really love doing. Yeah, what's kind of interesting as you're saying all that, I'm thinking about, uh, I kind of caught you at each step of the, the way. So yeah, a little bit. Originally, you know, I was watching you, my... my uh, parents watch the news every day, multiple times a day. So I, I caught you growing up and saw you calling the games. And, and so I knew you from that. I didn't know you. You didn't know me. But but I knew who you were. And then uh, shout out to Anthony Larigo. He invites me to a, right. net, a networking Hope event. Hope Anthony's doing well. Which, uh, yeah. And, and he, you know, we introduced, mm -hmm. or he introduced me to you, I believe, is how that worked. And you were at X at the time. Yep. And then I uh, worked with the guys here at VSP. When, when I was starting my business, Social Chameleon, they kind of embraced me a little bit here. And so I got to meet Trace, and I saw that you were on the team. I asked it for coffee. We grab a cup of yeah. coffee. We connect. And then another shout-out to Frank Caleri. That's right. At West Seneca Rotary. Sure, the Rotary guys at West Seneca are awesome. Yeah, and, and he, thank you, and, and Frank invites you out to... I've known Frank for 30 years, from the days when he was running around inside Buster Bison's costume. Isn't that crazy? Yep. Yeah. Shout out. Yeah. So the, the, the VSP thing happens because I had got, kind of developed a relationship with Trace George, who's the owner of the right. company. He's very involved at UB. We got to know each other. Kind of called me up one day and said, hey, uh, you know, let's get together. Let's have a cup of coffee. I want to talk to you about something. And and basically Trace said that they, they, they sensed that... One of the biggest growing parts of the business here at VSP was athletic facilities, mm -hmm. tied into what they had done at the Bills and the Sabres and UB. But he saw a lot of growth potential there in what in what this company does to enhance athletic facilities. And he said, "Hey, you know all the sports people. Um, let's let's figure out a way to make this combination." Yeah. So uh, it's been a wonderful experience for me to learn something new. Um, Trace has been great about letting me drift off and do some of my broadcasting stuff, and sure. I fit my responsibilities here at VSP around everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and the response from the sports community has been wonderful. Um, even people that don't necessarily know what my sports background is, but they've seen what VSP has done. And we've done incredible projects on the college level, on the high school level. Right. Um, and, and, you know, again, um, in the sports world, never more than ever before, 
It's about imaging and branding, and it leads to recruiting. Recruits want to see a, an atmosphere that that enhances them, that challenges them, that thrills them. Um, sometimes that leads to the decision where they want to go play to school. And and what what particularly Trace has done at UB is helped. Uh, incredibly remake the atmosphere and the environment at UB to appeal to a young high school football player that says, I want to be a part of this program. Look what I'm going to get to spend every day in an incredible atmosphere. Uh, and then that leads to getting better players, which leads to winning more games, which leads to going to bowl games. And uh, and then what happens is, is, is the colleges want to look like the pros, and then the high schools want to look like colleges. And and even though it's a dirty word, um, you have private schools in this town that are trying to bring kids in, that are competing with each other and competing with the district schools that the kid may live in. They need to enhance the atmosphere to make it uh, appealing to a young player. And in turn, the public schools have said, well, I don't want to keep losing my good players to the private schools. I want to give them a better atmosphere as well, too. So we have seen an incredible growth, even on the local college front, um, from the Division three schools like Buff State and Madai and Deuville. Um, they're all competing with each other for athletes. There's no scholarships at that level. So it becomes what's the academics, what's the atmosphere, what's the history. So we've had a credible um, run of success in helping almost all of those schools uh, increase what their what their athletic facilities look like. Mm-hmm. I've seen a few of them. Like I said earlier, it is. I mean, the UB facility, what you guys did there, is really. Uh, it looks pro. It I does, mean, it's yeah, the, the and that, that's a tribute to Trace this. and to Lance Leipold, the Bulls head coach, because he recognized that very early. Yeah. Um, Lance is an incredibly um, big picture, foresightful coach. Um, who spends a lot of time thinking about stuff like that in addition to the X's and O's because he knows that's how you sustain the success of a program. And now you're seeing the Bulls go to a bowl for the first yeah. time for two years in a row. That's a, that's sustaining the program. Yeah. Look at that. They're, give him the credit for that right here. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, no, we, no, we, no, no. No, I would say, though, part of it is the mentality. You go in that locker room, it looks like a championship place to yep. be. It's a, the team environment. Um, you can tell the players embrace it. I've seen a couple behind-the-scenes videos. Sure, where players and, and it's a visual generation of kids that have grown up it. with that now, so they yeah. demand it. You know, it, it, it's it's there's no more white walls on the locker room. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't get it. You don't get that anymore. That doesn't work anymore. It did for a long time. It did with an older generation, sure. but this is a younger generation that that has grown up, uh, been born in the late '90s, early 2000s, mm-hmm. when we've all become part of the yeah. digital era. And we're not talking about just a you know a fancy quote on the wall painted on the wall. Um, I'm going to hopefully get some pictures sure, of this yeah. to, to help. But use your color commentary here. Explain what are some of well, the things it, that you do to, to transform. You know, it, it's it could be transforming a locker room, adding LED lights. We did a wonderful project at Brockport where we 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 were the contractor on a complete redo of the locker room, um, new lockers, but it also included LED lights. So their colors are gold and green. So every locker had a gold and green, and it's all changeable as well too. And then there's a there's a huge Brockport eagle. Um, on the wall, like with with the eagle eyes, and that lights yeah. up, and and it's all about an atmosphere, and uh, it could be vinyl graphics on a wall, it could be uh, a, a, a fake rock wall, a fake masonry wall, it could be it could be a standout logo, um, it could be LED lights. Those are all the things that we do, uh, and it all just makes stuff stand out. That's mm-hmm. you have to stand out in the world today right. now, um, and and we do it from the design to the installation. Um, from start to finish, I'll meet with a client and say, what do you want to do here? What do you envision? Well, I, want to, I want this to look like this. I want that. Uh, and then I get those elements and I take them to our designers and our designers here are incredibly talented and they go to work on it and then all of a sudden they propose a picture of a locker room that looks a thousand times different than the one that it was before and then you know we take the client through the design phase and the and the if the price meets their budgets uh and then and then we produce everything here and we install everything here it's uh it, it, incredibly talented group of people here mm-hmm. and it's been very satisfying to see the the kind of success that we've had here and and we just finished one of the biggest projects this company has ever done which was an assignment from niagara university to say we have this dwyer arena it's about approaching 25 years old and it's kind of drab looking what can you guys do and we were able to come up with an incredible total redo of the Dwyer Arena that is one of the most amazing hockey rinks that I have ever seen in my life. But the one um, you, you showed us at Rotary? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully you'll be able to pop some pictures yeah. of it up here before and afters are incredible with branding of Niagara and Niagara Falls and the Purple Eagle and just everything that makes it an atmosphere that a player skates out on the ice and looks around and goes, I want to play my... And all of this works, even though my focus is on the sports development part of it, it works in a corporate setting too. You, you, If you want the best out of your employees, you want to give them an atmosphere that generates that kind of enthusiasm and we do office interiors and mm -hmm. and we do commercial settings and we do exterior signage because you need to stand out and uh, vehicle wraps because you want to not just have a plain white van going down the road you want to have a rolling billboard um, those are all the different parts of what's made this company so successful yeah I've seen a couple converted offices where you know you walk in it could be a bank right and mm -hmm. if the banks in Orchard Park it has it could have the Bill Stadium sure. and it could have so many different things going on it just it makes you feel like this this place cares yep. about how yep. you know and no and, and again we work with all kinds of different budgets it's not uh, it, it's generally not as uh, as expensive as people think it is to be able to do some mm -hmm. of these transformations and we have the ability to to, to work with anybody's budgets we've done uh, uh, some really cool work at uh, a number of the sweet home schools, even from the high school to the elementary school, the high school wanted a better messaging. Um, they, they have their sort of pillars of success. They wanted to illustrate those. Those are on the main hallway that every student walks by numerous times every day. And they wanted that to filter down to the elementary school. So the younger kids start to, to begin their journey to high school knowing how important it is to be a part of the Sweet Home mm -hmm. um, a school district and be a Panther. And that's been an incredible opportunity to, to, to do something outside of sports, but with generally the same end goal involved. Yeah, I mean, the fans can see it first and then they can become a student, a player on the team. Sure. In their it's about building pride. I remember in, that. Forever. Right. Building pride in, in your community, in your area, and where you are. Um, I had a high school athletic to tell me I want to show, I want my kids to be proud of wearing that school name and that logo on their uniform, and I want them to, to feel that pride every day they walk into the gym. Yeah. And so I, I like to wrap up with this. Um, you know, your story is tremendous. That's why I wanted you on the show. Thank you for your time. My doing pleasure. This. If you can give one message to our audience, leaving them inspired to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams, what would that be? Well, you know, there's going to be hurdles. There's going to be bumps in the road. I've had a few of them myself, and and uh, you know, and some of it of my own doing, some of it not. Um, some of it of the way the world has changed around. What I, you know, I've, I've been asked, what would you, uh, what would you uh, tell yourself? Uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I would have told myself, be prepared for the entire industry that you're in to, to change almost completely, you know? And, yeah. and I'm not the only one. I think a lot of people in a lot of different industries could say the very same thing. Um, but you, you have to you either have to adapt um, and do it the way they want to do it, or you have to adapt on your own and say, I want to do it this way. Can I make it a go outside of that corporate setting or whatever? But have confidence, have faith in yourself. It always comes down to the same things of preparation, hard work, and communication. Um, if you can master those three things, it doesn't matter what industry you're in or what challenge you're facing, you're going to come out ahead. Say the big three again. You know, what, say the uh, three. what did I say? Preparation, yep. um, hard work, and communication. Communication, yep. yeah. Very good. I think those are three... Uh, great takeaways, you know, and because preparation it leads to confidence, and you have to be confident in what you're doing, no matter what it is. Whether you're choosing to start your own business, um, whether you're accepting a new job, whether you're changing industries, mm -hmm. um, you better be confident. The only way that I ever know to be confident, whether I'm walking in to call a football game or uh, or whatever, is knowing the material, be having sure. been prepared, having having felt like I am ready for anything that's going to come my way, yeah. uh, including a seven overtime game that I had a couple <laughs> years ago that that's tied for the longest overtime game in NCW. You think I was ready for that? Yeah. You think I was prepared to be on the hour on this on the air for an hour straight without a commercial break? No, but that's your job. You better be. And whether yeah. you, you better be ready for whatever comes your way. Mm -hmm. And you only do that by being prepared and being ready. Okay, I know what's gonna happen now. Mm -hmm. All right, bring it on. I know what's gonna I know I'm ready for it now. And communication goes both you know, it can take that to the sales channel. It sure. can go into the networking side of things. It can go to you being on air. I think something that's really important for, you know, if you're listening to this and you're in sales, 
remembering that communication is key over like product knowledge. Sure. Where a lot of times people just I am no you. expert on yeah. vinyl graphics. Right. I'm, I'm better than I used to be. <laughs> I am no expert, but I do like to think I'm pretty good at communicating. And that's what I try to uh, let all my clients know that, that there, there's going to be great communication. Yeah. If I don't have the answer, I'm not going to be embarrassed by that. Right. I'm going to go back and get the answer from the people that do have it. And if you simply were talking about the different glues and the fabrics and the this and the that, and you're not really listening to the person's right. challenge or how you right. can overcome or how you can help them, then uh, you're most likely not getting the gig. That's so, right. Uh, that you know, communication is on so many different levels. So uh, speaking of that, in talking about Buffalo Sports Page, one more time, how we can tune into you. And again, thank you for uh, yeah, bu- this. BuffaloSportsPage.com at Buff Sports Page on social media, and then all the stuff that I've been doing at UB on any of the UB athletics channels, football, basketball, uh, you know, Buffalo Bulls. UB Bulls. Uh, doing a lot more stuff there, having a lot of fun. Um, it's an interesting challenge, working more on the team end of things, but in a lot of ways, that's kind of the future where sports casting is going. Yeah. Um, where the teams are the ones that have the the, the the interest, the desire, and in a lot of cases, the revenue to continue to create and add where a lot of the local outlets like newspapers and televisions are starting to pull back a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we like to stay on top of a lot of stuff at UB. Um, I have a chance to call the football games on the radio. You may be watching this uh, when I'm in the Bahamas for the Bahamas Bowl <laughs> coming up on December 20th. Um, we do those on ESPN 1520. And then uh, I have a chance to call the do most of the home basketball men's and women's games, which are on usually on ESPN Plus, um, which is an, a, a fun a fun for me too. So somewhere later in another edition, I'll tell you we'll we'll dive really deep into the woods and tell you the challenge of doing a game on radio versus a game on TV. People think it's the same. Mm-hmm. Think y'all oh, you're just calling a game. Oh no, they're very very different skill sets that are involved. So yeah. I bounce between one and the other. That that's a lot of fun sometimes too. But great stuff going on at UB. Uh, there is room in this town for sports fans to follow the Bills and the Sabers and carve out a little niche for a really good. College college athletics program yeah the, it, buffalo's buzzing right now we got the bills looking at the playoffs they they win and they're in yep you know big game right now against yep. the sabers Ravens. maybe you're getting this turned around until pr- most likely early january so right. at that point who knows where we're at okay, playoffs baby. right now as we as playoffs. I say this we're we're talking playoffs um, Paul, thank you so much for your time. And Pleasure, did you Mike. Say you're going to the Bahamas. Did well, you yeah, you, did you, 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 you I did sneak that in. UB was picked to go play in the Bahamas Bowl. Um, you may be watching this after it already happened on December sure. 20th. But as my role of the announcer of, for football, I get to travel with the team. We're going down four days before the game, so I get to spend a week in the Bahamas to uh, to really dive in and prepare for the yeah. uh, football game. Yeah. Oh, I get to get to do it by the by the pool. Well, see, thirty years of working hard and it's finally yep. paid off. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it has. So, uh, and, and that's what's great about being tied to a team is you get to you know you get to have those adventures yeah. uh, along with the rest of the guys. Well, enjoy your time Thank down you. there, and uh, don't miss us too much in snowy Buffalo. I will miss you not at all <laughs> uh, in eighty degree weather in the Bahamas. <laughs> guys, thanks for tuning in, Paul Peck, VSP Graphic Group, and uh, again, thank you guys for always being here supporting. Tune in to Paul on uh, Twitter and check out buffalosportspage.com. Thank you, Mike. Hey, guys. As always, a huge thank you for tuning in. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from Paul's message. Be prepared to adapt on the fly. The way to perform at a high level as you handle tasks that you didn't expect in the moment is preparation, hard work, and communication. It makes me think of the famous quote from Seneca, Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And a big shout out, a huge shout out to my hometown UB Bulls for bringing home a bowl championship for the first time in school history, winning the Bahamas Bowl, and also to the Buffalo Bills for clinching the playoffs two out of the last three seasons under Coach McDermott. Buffalo is buzzing right now. The Bills face off Saturday, January 4th against the Houston Texans at 4.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on ESPN. So excited to see this team grow. And I'm grateful for all of you for tuning into my podcast. A shout out to everyone who's been sending feedback. I appreciate the reviews on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the messages that have been coming in on social media as well. I love you guys. Thank you so much for making this journey as much fun as it's been so far. I appreciate you helping spread the love. You can check out more show notes and information at mikeduppodcast.com. 
M-I-K-E-D, up, podcast.com, powered by Social Chameleon. You know what to do. Be great and be grateful.